Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Online Economics of Platforms seminar. Today we have Andrew Rhodes uh, presenting from the uh, Toulouse School of Economics, presenting platform design when sellers use pricing algorithms. Uh, and Alex McKay discussing. Uh, Andrew will have 40 minutes for his presentation with clarifying questions from the audience. Uh, Alex will have five minutes for his discussion and then we'll move on to a general Q&A. I will stop recording after an hour, uh, but uh, the, we welcome the discussion to continue and I will stay here as long as it's needed. Uh, before we move uh, to the presentation, uh, let me just uh, remind uh, that if anyone in the audience has a paper on platforms that they would want to present, uh, please contact us and especially uh, Julian Wright and Andrew, Andrew, uh, Andre Hadju. Uh, and with that, let's move to the presentation. Uh, Andrew, the floor is yours and you're welcome to share the screen with your slides. Uh, and also uh, unmute yourself. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, um, so thanks very much for the invitation. Thanks everyone for attending. Um, this is joined with Justin Johnson from Cornell and Matthias Wildenbeest from Indiana. Okay, so in the interest of time, let me be uh, pretty brief with the motivation. Um, so many products are sold through online marketplaces. And increasingly, sellers on those marketplaces have access to software, um, which use algorithms to set and then change prices. So for example, as far back as 2015, it was estimated that around 30% of the best-selling products on the Amazon marketplace were priced by algorithms, a number which has probably significantly increased in the last couple of years. Now, this increased use of algorithms has prompted a debate. So on the one hand, there are some people who might argue that algorithms could lead to fiercer competition. They make it easier to adjust prices in response to changes in cost or demand conditions. On the other hand, there are other people who are concerned that algorithms may lead to collusive outcomes. So there are a couple of cases where algorithms were used to implement um, collusive schemes designed by humans. Um, but arguably more interestingly, there's recent evidence from economists showing that algorithms may learn to play um, collusive strategies, even when they haven't been designed explicitly to do that. So our contribution to this debate is to note that irrespective of whether algorithms lead to more or less competition, um, platforms are not passive participants. Platforms can design certain features of their marketplaces to influence the way that sellers and their algorithms price. Okay, so for example, um, platforms can affect the way in which sellers are ordered and ultimately displayed to consumers. Okay, so just to give a concrete example of what we have in mind, consider the Amazon buy box. Um, so the Amazon buy box shows very prominently one seller amongst many of a particular product. And then if consumers want to look at other sellers of that product, they have to hover or click elsewhere on the page. Now, winning the buy box is known to be very important. Um, it's believed that on average, over 80% of the demand of a product that just, uh, goes to the firm that wins the buy box. At the same time, the exact procedure that determines who wins the buy box is not known. What we do know is that the seller with the lowest price doesn't always win. Um, but based on some studies that have scraped and analyzed data from Amazon Marketplace, we know that having a low price and having good recent past performance does help a firm to win the buy box. Okay, so um, I wanna keep the introduction very brief so I can get through a little bit more about what we do, but let me just give a quick overview. So what do we do in this paper? Well, we consider simple design policies, which are a little bit inspired by the buy box and which steer demand to a subset of the sellers. Then first of all, we examine in theory um, how these design policies might affect various market outcomes. We show that it is indeed important to distinguish between whether sellers are behaving competitively or cooperatively. And we also show that design policies can completely destabilize collusion, even as sellers become infinitely patient. So even as we would think collusion would be uh, easiest to sustain. Um, then we look at what happens when um, 
prices are set by algorithms, we examine the effect of these design policies and we highlight some similarities, but also what we think are some quite interesting differences between what is predicted by theory and what happens when the algorithms are at play. Okay, given it's a very short talk, um, I propose that I won't say very much about the literature, but let me maybe just mention that the theory part of this talk uh, relates to a literature on steering. One important difference is that we're going to look at steering in context where sellers may be colluding. Um, and let me also say that the second part of the talk uh, will be very related to this recent AI paper by um, Calvano and Colthers. So what they do is they simulate AI pricing algorithms and they show that they learn to sustain high prices by playing, uh, by supporting collusive strategies, reward punishment strategies. So what we do is we take a very similar setting, um, but then we look at how a platform might be able to design the marketplace to guide the behavior of those algorithms, potentially undermining those collusive strategies. Okay, so I know it's a bit early, but maybe let me just briefly pause and see if there are any quick questions. Otherwise, I'll go into the model. Okay, so there are no questions. Okay. Um, so let me move to the theory part of the paper. So I'll start by introducing um, our model. So this is a very simple game between uh, N greater than or equal to two firms that sell differentiated products at a common constant marginal cost C. These firms interact repeatedly uh, over an infinite horizon on a monopoly retail platform. And in each period T of this game, the firms are able to observe all past prices and other market outcomes. And by that, I mean in particular, the result of any platform intervention. Okay, exactly what I mean by that will become clearer in the next few slides. But in any, any given period, firms observe the whole history and then they simultaneously set a price that they will charge in that particular period. Um, firms also have a common discount factor delta strictly between zero and one. So this is the firm side of the marketplace. Then on the other side, uh, in each period, we have a unit mass of consumers. Consumers enter the market, stay for one period, and then exit and are replaced by a new unit mass of consumers. And in each period, consumers wish to buy at most one of these products. Okay. We're going to assume that um, if a consumer buys product I in period T, then she gets a payoff UIT, which is equal to A. So we can think of this as the quality of the product minus the price that she pays plus a zeta i, which is uh, some random taste shock reflecting uh, product differentiation. Similarly, uh, if the consumer instead takes the outside option in period t, she gets a utility u zero t, which is equal to a constant a naught, plus again, a preference shock zeta naught. Okay, throughout the talk, we're gonna focus on the logit model. And so we're gonna assume that zeta naught and zeta i, each of these zeta i are iid draws, from a type one extreme value distribution with scale parameter mu. And therefore mu is going to index the amount of product differentiation in this product category. Okay, lastly, as I suggested in the introduction, um, we're also going to have a platform. So we're gonna focus on very simple design policies. In particular, in each period of this marketplace, the platform um, will display a subset of the products to consumers. Now in this very stark theory model, um, we're going to assume that uh, the platform chooses some subset of products to show and consumers can only take the outside option or buy from that subset of products. But when we move to the experiments with the algorithms, we'll allow for a much richer setup. Okay, but just bear in mind in the theory model, we have this quite stark assumption. So consumers are shown a particular subset of products. They can only choose amongst that subset. And as in the paper, um, I'm gonna look at two very simple ways in which this subset of products could be generated and then examine the consequences of that for market outcomes. Okay, so that's the model. Um, I'm now gonna introduce two uh, different design features that we examine. So the first one is called price directed prominence or PDP. Um, and this one is very, very simple. Uh, under PDP, in any period, the platform will simply pick out K firms who have the lowest prices and it will display only those to consumers. Um, if there are any ties for the case lowest price, these ties are broken randomly. Um, and then, as I said, in this very stark theory version of the model, 
Um, once we've picked those K firms, the other N minus K firms are discarded and consumers are unable to choose them. Okay, so let me first of all start with this very simple design policy and then I'll look at a, a subtler one later on and compare and contrast. Okay, but given this very simple policy, let me now look at the implications for market outcomes. So given that this is a short talk, I'm gonna focus uh, almost exclusively on implications for prices and consumer surplus, but in the paper, we also look at other things such as platform profits, and perhaps I'll say a word about that uh, at the end of the talk, if I have time. Okay, now again, as I alluded to earlier, when we look at the, the effect of these interventions, it's important to distinguish between whether sellers are playing competitively or cooperatively. Okay, so let's start with the case where sellers behave competitively, by which we mean in any period, sellers act as if this were the only period in which they're around in the marketplace. So they just pay static. Um, okay, so first of all, clearly, if there were no intervention by the platform, then consumers would see all firms. Okay, and we know that firms will then charge a Bertrand Nash price PBN star, which is strictly greater than C because there is some product differentiation by assumption. On the other hand, with price directed prominence, only K strictly less than N firms are going to be displayed. Okay, and so it's easy to see that the firms are going to Bertrand compete for the right to be shown. Okay, and so very simply, this intervention creates a trade-off for consumers. On the one hand, uh, PDP means that consumers are exposed to less variety, they have less options to choose from. But on the other hand, each option that they can choose from now has a lower price. Okay, and so uh, not too surprisingly, what one can show is that um, if I start with the case where there is no intervention, and then I introduce PDP into the marketplace, um, consumers benefit from this intervention, if and only if the, the proportion K over N of sellers that is displayed exceeds a threshold. Now in the paper, of course, we examine that, that threshold in much more detail. Um, let me just point out here that obviously condition on using PDP, because prices are at marginal cost due to this competition to, to be displayed, consumers obviously prefer it if there is more variety being displayed to them. Nevertheless, uh, one can show in this particular logit model that consumers benefit from this intervention even if almost two thirds of the firms are obscured. In other words, th this, uh, the increased price competition is so strong that even if you, if you lose almost two thirds of the varieties, you're still better off. And in particular, one can show that consumers are always better off uh, if K is equal to N minus one, such that only one firm is hidden. Okay, so that's what happens in a, in a competitive market. So in a competitive market, um, this intervention may work quite well. That unfortunately is not necessarily true in a cartelized market. Um, so to illustrate that as simply as possible, let me just focus on what we call a full collusion benchmark, meaning that sellers collude in such a way that in each period, they choose prices to maximize total industry profit, or equivalently, they choose the same prices as would a K product monopolist, where again, K is just the number of uh, cheaper sellers who are displayed to consumers. Um, now for the usual reasons, collusion in this model is sustainable if and only if sellers are sufficiently patient. Um, so in particular, if we have PDP with K firms being shown, then there exists some critical dis discount factor delta K hat, such a collusion is sustained, full collusion is sustainable if and only if delta exceeds that threshold. Um, and what one can show is that again, condition on using PDP, um, as we display uh, fewer firms, this critical discount factor increases. And so the range of delta for which full collusion is sustainable decreases. In other words, a more aggressive implementation of this policy makes it harder for firms to sustain full collusion. The intuition behind this result is quite simple um, and comes in two parts. So firstly, of course, if fewer firms are being shown, then fully collusive profits, or in other words, monopoly profits are lower. And so each firm's benefit of sticking with uh, the fully collusive agreement is lower. At the same time, um, you can also show that each firm's um, uh, optimal payoff if they deviate from full collusion is higher when fewer firms are being displayed. Intuitively, this is, this is just because if fewer firms are being displayed, then you face less competition. So your demand condition on deviating is higher. Okay. So, so in cartelized markets, if we focus on full collusion, um, PDP, a more aggressive implementation of that makes it harder to sustain collusion. Okay, at the same time, however, um, one might think that if algorithms can um, move very quickly, so set prices very quickly, then that's effectively 
meaning that time periods are very short. Okay, so that's kind of the same as saying that um, delta agency's patience level may be high. Okay, so again, just to illustrate um, the result, let's assume that delta is actually very high. Okay, so delta is so high that full collusion would, would be sustainable even with this platform intervention. Okay, then what we can show is the following simple result, which is that a more aggressive implementation of PDP, so K, the number of firms being shown, is lower. Well, first of all, it leads to lower prices, but now it also leads to lower consumer surplus. Okay, lower prices uh, is, is very intuitive because these are just monopoly prices. If a multi-product monopolist has fewer products, it's less worried about cannibalization, so it charges less. But here it turns out that these lower prices are not enough to compensate consumers for the loss in variety. And so we get a very different conclusion compared to what we saw in competitive markets. Okay, so just to wrap up with this particular intervention, what we see is that this very simple intervention could work well in a competitive market, but could behave quite poorly, uh, potentially in cartelized markets. Okay, and so for that reason, um, we then look at a, another uh, subtler intervention, which we call dynamic uh, price directive prominence. So before I give the formal details, the idea behind this policy is to try and reward firms that charge low prices today, not just with extra demand today, but also demand in the future. Okay, and, and we'll show that with this policy, it's much easier to undermine collusive schemes, even when sellers are very patient. Okay, so now let me go through uh, the formal definition. So dynamic price directed prominence or, D, or DPDP works as follows. Um, so firstly, in, in the initial period zero, all of the firms set a price and the platform chooses one firm with the lowest price. It displays that firm to consumers and then it confers an advantage on that firm for the following period, for period one. Okay, so now let me explain a little bit more what this advantage means. So consider some later period, period T. And suppose that going into that period, firm I has the advantage. Well, in period T, this firm with the advantage, firm I, will again be the one shown to consumers and will keep that advantage for the following period if two conditions are satisfied. One condition is that firm I should not in this period have raised its price relative to the previous period. So firm I has either kept its price the same or has cut it. And secondly, firm I should not have been undercut by any other firm by too much. And when we say too much, we mean in particular uh, a fixed level ADV, which is controlled by the platform. So this allows, so firm I could be undercut a little bit, um, but as long as it's not undercut by too much by other firms, then it keeps, the, it's still the only firm being displayed and it keeps this advantage going into the next period. Okay, so again, just to, just to recap what is going on here, um, in the first period, so period zero, um, the platform looks at all of the sellers, looks at their prices and picks out one of them that has the lowest price. It displays that firm to consumers, like in PDP, but it also confers an advantage on that firm for the next period. In period one and all subsequent periods, going into the period, there's gonna be one firm that has this advantage. So the platform looks at who that firm is and it checks, first of all, has that firm not raised its price compared to the previous period? And secondly, has it not been undercut by too much? by some fixed amount ADV that the platform specifies up front. If that's true, firm I keeps the advantage for the next period and is the only firm that is displayed. If either of these two conditions is violated, so firm I has raised its price, or if it's been undercut by a large amount, so more than ADV, then the advantage is taken away from firm I. And it's as if we're back in the initial period. So again, the platform looks at all of the sellers, looks at their prices, picks out one firm that has the lowest price, displays that firm, and gives the advantage to that firm in the following period. Okay, so I hope, so I hope that's more or less clear. So again, just, just to stress, the idea here is that um, this policy is aiming to reward sellers who charge low prices, not just in the period where they do it, I think particularly the first period, but other periods where this advantage is up for grabs, reward them not just in that period, but in later periods as well. Okay, so um, what we can show given this policy is the following result. Um, so again, collusion, uh, in order to look at uh, sustainability of collusion, there's gonna be some critical discount factor delta hat. So there exists a delta hat, such that if delta is less than delta hat, then in any pure strategy, sub game perfect Nash equilibrium of this game, 
the transaction price, i.e. the price charged by the displayed seller, equals marginal cost in all periods. Moreover, we can show two uh, interesting things. So firstly, uh, as you increase ADV, remember this ADV is the cushion that the advantaged firm has, right? It keeps its advantage unless it's undercut by more than ADV. Okay, so as we increase that cushion, as we increase ADV, this critical discount factor delta hat increases, okay? Meaning that the range of uh, delta for which we get marginal cost pricing increases. Moreover, one can prove that for ADV above a threshold, this critical dis discount factor delta hat is actually equal to one. Okay, what does that mean? Well, that means that if a ADV is sufficiently high, even as delta tends to one, so even as firms become infinitely patient, in the equilibrium of this game, the firm that is displayed to consumers always charges marginal cost. So in other words, for sufficiently high ADV, collusion is completely destabilized. Okay, so what is the intuition for this? Well, it comes back to, to what I said on the previous page. If you think about it, dynamic PDP makes collusion harder because it's more difficult for firms in the industry to punish firms at cut price. So for example, suppose that the firms were trying to uh, engage in full collusion. If one firm cheats and undercuts today on that agreement, it'll still demand today, but because of this ADV cushion, it will also be able, if ADV is high enough, to price above marginal costs in future periods, still make some profit, and none of the other firms can compete it out of the marketplace. Um, and this is why for ADV sufficiently large, collusion can, can become impossible even as delta tends to one. But notice though that even if this ADV is very high, in equilibrium, the firm that transacts with consumers charges marginal costs, and so ADV doesn't actually distort prices in any way. It just pushes them down to marginal cost. Um, I haven't put the details on the slide, but it's easy to see that in cartelized markets where delta is very high, dynamic price uh, directed prominence could be very beneficial for consumers. Again, there is the same variety loss that we had um, with the first intervention, but now prices may be brought down from monopoly levels to marginal cost, even when, even when firms are rotation. Okay, so um, the next thing I wanna do in the talk, so this is, so just to sum up, so we've looked at two simple interventions. The first one could work well in competitive markets, less well in cartelized markets. Then we have this subtler intervention, um, which seeks to reward firms with low prices, not just today, but in the future. Turns out that has very similar properties to PDP in competitive markets, but it can work very well in cartelized markets. So the next thing we want to do is then see how these- Sorry, uh, Andrew, can I ask a question, please? Yeah. Oh, there is a, the, the, I know that there is a, a break for questions just after this slide. Okay, thank yeah. you. <laughs> Uh, hence, I was I was I was holding off on that question. So so uh, Andrew, there is a question in the chat okay. from Vincenzo uh, asking whether the mechanism would work with heterogeneous consumers, which means that the lowest quality adjusted price may be different for different cons uh, different consumers. So you mean if products differ in terms of quality? Is that the question? Uh, well, yes. if consumer, yeah. What I mean, think of a model with, with horizontal differentiation, not only vertical differentiation. So consumers are heterogeneous, and if you adjust prices by quality, then different consumers may have different um, products with, with the lowest quality adjusted price. Well, I mean, so here we do have the horizontal differentiation because we have the, the logit shock. Um, I think it would work if we also had some both types of differentiation. I don't see why not provided that that vertical differentiation was not too large. Of course, one would have to then think about products differing in cost as well. An important assumption here is that the products have the same cost. So that simplifies things a little bit. Is there another question or should I go on? Uh, yes, please. I'm not entirely sure, but your second mechanism looks very much like uh, selling the, telling the firms you can bid now and then you can sell forever at the price which you bid. And in this case, of course, you break collusion. Is, is, there a, is there a difference? So selling the market in the first period. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think that's a fair comment. Um, I mean, remember the theory model is very stylized. So, I mean, if you thought about a richer model where maybe in the future, you could have firms coming in with lower costs, there would be some innovation, then I think that this model would still allow those firms to compete if they're, if they're sufficiently strong. 
So this model works by having this, this ADV, so you need ADV to be positive, but of course it may not necessarily be so large. Of course, this is also very stark. I mean, you might think that you would give this advantage away for some number of periods, and then you would allow firms to compete again. So I'm sure you could fine tune this. This is just to show in a very stark setting uh, the kind of trade-offs that arise. But I agree in this very simple setting, you're correct, yeah. That's effectively what happens. And uh, Bruno asks in the chat, what happens if uh, costs change randomly? Um, that is a good question. I'm not sure. We haven't, we haven't checked that. Again, presumably, I mean, presuming that there's not too much variation in costs, one can imagine that the same trade-offs will come out. And so probably if this policy works well for consumers, if there are a little bit of randomness in costs, I'm sure that it would also work, work fine. If there were large variation, then we're not sure. But that's a good question. Okay, thanks. Should I, should I go on? Yeah, I think, yeah. Okay, so I have about, how long do I have left? Uh, you have about uh, 13 minutes left. 13. 13. 13, yeah. Okay. So um, now let me move on and just discuss very quickly um, a little bit about the algorithms that we use. Um, so to set the scene, um, consider the following abstract setting. So suppose there's an agent facing uh, a finite action set X and some finite space S. Okay, imagine that if this agent takes action X in state S, she gets some payoff pi S of X. Okay, and imagine that transitions between states, which could be probabilistic, depend on both the current action and the state. Now this agent is a long-lived player and she wants to choose actions to maximize her totally expected discounted payoff. The problem is that at least initially, she's uninformed both of this pi function and potentially about the transitions between states. Okay, and so she wants to learn that information. We're gonna follow um, many other papers, both in the recent economics literature and also computer science by looking at a class of algorithms called Q-learning algorithms. So I'll give a little bit more detail on the next slide, but the idea is that these algorithms seek to iteratively estimate what is known as an action value function, Q star S of X, which gives the value to the agent of playing action X in state S, given that she's gonna behave optimally in the future. Okay, so, and just notice that if the agent is able to estimate this matrix, this Q star matrix, then she will know what optimal policy she should play in each state. Okay, and so in particular, if we're in state S, the agent can just take this matrix and read off either the appropriate row or column, look at the value of taking each of the actions and find the action X tilde to maximize her payoff. Okay, so how in practice would you implement this? Well, um, you start with some initial, perhaps arbitrary matrix Q, and then you want to iteratively uh, update this over time. Okay, so just very quickly to give you a flavor of how this works, imagine that the agent is in state S at time T. The agent can do one of two things according to Q learning. So firstly, she can experiment with some probability epsilon T, which is specified by the agent up front. And when she experiments, the simplest thing to do would just be to choose, randomly choose an action and see what payoff she gets and which state she moves to. With complementary probability one minus epsilon t, the agent may also exploit, in which case she chooses the action which she thinks is best given the current Q matrix available to her. Now, whether she experiments or she exploits, um, the agent will take some action X, she'll get some realized payoff and she'll transit to a new state S prime. Having done that, she then uses this new information to update this Q matrix up here that she started with. In particular, she's gonna update the cell corresponding to the state S that she was in and the action X that she just took. And this updating depends on a parameter alpha, which again, that the agent sets up front. Okay, and so all this equation says is that the way in which you update the cell is as follows. So you start off with some value in the Q matrix given by this, and you get some new information about the value of taking this action in that particular state, which is the flow payoff you just got and a discounted value of what you, what you read off from the Q matrix given that you've transited to state S prime. What the agent then does is take some convex combination of those two things, depending on this weight alpha, and then this arrow just means you then update 
that, or that the former cell in the Q matrix with this new information. This is an iterative procedure. So the agent then keeps doing this. In the next period, she does this from state S prime and so on and so forth. Um, in single agent problems where you're just playing against nature, under mild conditions, you're guaranteed to converge to an optimal policy. Um, in most studies, including ours, in multi-agent settings, you get convergence, even though in theory, there's nothing that guarantees that. But typically, it does arise. Um, so I guess I don't have much time, but let me just briefly say, so why, why use Q-learning? Well, a lot of other recent papers in economics have used this. Um, one advantage is that there are not too many parameters that you have to specify, so you don't have too much wiggle room when you set up the algorithm. Um, but it's also true that reinforcement learning techniques like Q-learning are a, a, a simple building block of many algorithms which are used in more complex real life settings. So this is just uh, a picture of Lee Sedol, a very well known player of the board game Go, um, who was beaten 4-1 by a Google DeepMind um, computer, which was using AI, including Q-learning, to learn how to play that game. Okay, in terms of how we uh, implement this in our game, I probably don't want to spend too much time on this because I want to have enough time to go through the results. Um, let me just say that the basic setup without the platform design and the parameterizations that we use are very similar to this recent AR paper by Calvano and co-authors. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we build on the theory model in a couple of important ways. One is that we introduce a parameter gamma that captures the degree of platform design. So in particular, when we run our simulations, we uh, assume that a fraction one minus gamma of the population just sees all of the firms, regardless of what prices they charge or have charged in the past. And the remaining gamma uh, consumers are exposed to either PDP or dynamic PDP. Okay, and so obviously if gamma is equal to zero, there's no intervention, consumers see all firms. If gamma is equal to one, that's like the theory model, but we also allow for anything in between those two extremes. Um, just a few details. Uh, before I get to the results. So we um, look at prices between one, which in our parameterizations is marginal cost, and 2.1, which is a little bit above the fully collusive level. Um, we discretize that into 15 elements. And then as in the Calvano paper, um, we use a one period memory. So the state space is just the set of possible prices that were charged in the previous period. Each firm has its own Q matrix and it updates it in the way that I showed on the previous slide. Um, we run the algorithms until the strategy has been stable for 100,000 periods. We average over those periods, and then we do 1,000 runs for each set of parameters just to smooth out the results. Okay, so I know that was a bit quick, but uh, given, given that I don't have much time, I won't say anything more about that. I'll pause again if there are any questions. Otherwise, I will, or maybe I should go through some results and then pause for questions after that. Uh, there are no questions in the chat for this part, so, um, okay. so, so I'll, go I'll keep going. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in the paper, we run a lot of experiments. Here, I'm just going to pick out a few to give you a flavor of some of the results. Um, so for this talk, I'm going to focus on a setting where there are two firms, uh, discount factor of 0 0.95, and the logic parameter is a quarter. Okay, and just as a first step, uh, it's, of course, important to look at what happens if there is no platform intervention. So there's no PDP or dynamic PDP. So in other words, this gamma parameter is just equal to zero. Um, so some simple computations show that the Bertrand Nash price in this setting in theory is about 1.5. Fully collusive price would be about 1.9. And when we run our algorithms, they tend to settle on a price of about 1.7. Okay, so roughly halfway between competition and collusion. And so of course, this is, uh, very much in line with the results of Calvano and co-authors. Okay, then the next step is of course, to introduce into this into the setting, our two design features. Okay, so let me start with price directed prominence. Um, so what these two graphs are doing is on the X axis, we're plotting, uh, remember we only have two firms here, so K is equal to one. So a fraction gamma of the population just sees the cheapest firm and a proportion one minus gamma sees both of the firms. So we're plotting, um, that proportion gamma. And then on the y-axis here, we have the share weighted prices and here consumer surplus. Now in both of these diagrams, the red line is showing um, what theory would predict for uh, a fully collusive cartel. And the blue line is showing as we vary uh, gamma, what happens to the price charged by algorithms. So what you can see here is that as we increase gamma, initially the price increases, 
then eventually it decreases and price ends up about 7% lower than with full intervention compared to no intervention. Similarly, consumer surplus ends up about 7% lower. Um, so this is, if you remember, this is very much consistent with what we said in theory um, for full collusion. We expect that this intervention reduces prices, but not by enough to offset the loss in variety, and so consumers are made worse off. Um, okay, let me skip that for now. So now let me look at the second intervention, um, dynamic price-directed prominence. Um, so again, here we're just plotting on the x-axis the extent of platform intervention gamma, and then the prices and consumer surplus. The blue lines are what happens with um, PDP, that's just copied from the previous slide, and the red line is showing what happens when we implement dynamic price-directed prominence. And what you can see, again, very much consistent with the theory, um, once gamma is above about 0.2, um, dynamic price-directed prominence leads to much stronger price decreases and much stronger consumer surplus increases. Um, so again, consistent with the theory, um, dynamic PDP leads to much lower prices and higher consumer surplus. Now, of course, one difference with the theory is that although prices are lower, they don't fall all the way to marginal costs, but they do fall quite significantly. Um, now, if you look at these graphs, you'll see one interesting feature is that when we move to gamma equals to one, um, under dynamic price-directed prominence, prices jump up very strongly and consumer surplus jumps down very strongly. So we attribute this, uh, as I mentioned here, to a learning challenge. So if you think about what does gamma equal to one mean, it means that one of these firms gets no demand. Moreover, because you have this pricing advantage, um, the firm without the advantage may get zero demand even for a broad range of prices that it might charge. If it charges high prices, but even if it charges prices that are a little bit below those charged by the advantage firm because right, it doesn't charge enough to, to, to pull back the advantage. Um, so in that case, if a firm is getting zero demand for a broad range of prices, it might be quite hard for it to learn. So I don't have time to go through the details, but in the paper, we show what happens if we have what we call a smarter AI, where we augment the state space with more information. Um, we avoid this big jump here, and actually we get even nicer, stronger results. Um, again, let me skip that for, for now. Okay, so I, I guess I only have a few minutes left, but let me just summarize um, so far. So what, so what we've seen is that um, both with PDP and dynamic PDP, although there are some differences with what theory predicts, qualitatively uh, the predictions are, what, what happens in practice is not too far from what theory suggested. Um, one more thing that I wanna discuss um, very quickly. So remember in the theory model, I said it was important to distinguish between whether sellers were behaving competitively or collusively. Okay, so we also try to get at that in our simulations. So again, we take the same setup here with two firms and logic parameter of a quarter, but now we're gonna vary seller discount factors. Okay, and the idea would be that um, if, if the discount factor is quite low, that might proxy for a more competitive market. And if Delta is high, that may proxy for a more collusive market. Um, so the first panel here is just a heat map showing uh, on the X axis, Again, the proportion of consumers who only see one price, so the amount of platform intervention. And on the y-axis, we have the discount factor delta. Uh, and what you can see is that if I were to fix a particular level of gamma, as I increase the discount factor, this is showing consumer surplus. So if you, if you read off here, red numbers mean that consumer surplus is very high. Um, green means that consumer surplus is kind of intermediate and blue colors mean that consumer surplus is quite low. Okay, and very nicely, as you increase the discount factor, you can see that consumer surplus seems to monotonically fall, which is, which is kind of, I guess, a sanity check. It's suggesting that the algorithms are managing to sustain higher prices and therefore push consumer surplus down more in markets where uh, the discount factor is higher. Okay, another thing that we do, so this is all about consumer surplus level. Then we look at the percentage change in consumer surplus due to the intervention. Okay, so just to illustrate what we mean by this, take for example, gamma equals 0.7 and delta equals 0.5. So what does this point here represent? This point says, suppose that we fix delta at 0.5, this is the percentage change in consumer surplus if we go from no intervention, so gamma equals zero, up to gamma 0.7. And again, um, dark red colors mean that consumer surplus is going up and going up by a lot. Um, Green means that it's not changing very much at all, and blue means that it's decreasing. 
And again, if I were to take a slice of this graph, so for example, I looked at gamma equals 0.7, um, in markets where the discount factor is quite low, which we might think of as competitive markets, we see that this intervention works very well. Um, but it can work quite badly when delta is very high, which we take as a proxy for a cartelized market. So again, this is kind of qualitatively consistent with the theory that I went through um, earlier. Okay, I probably don't have time to, to show that, but we get very similar patterns that are also very much consistent with theory when we look at dynamic price directed prominence. Okay, so I don't know whether you want to, whether I should take some questions or whether I should just do some extensions. So, so, so Andrew, I mean, there are uh, several interesting questions that uh, are showing up in the chat, but I think most of them are more proper for a general Q&A asking about the uh, incentive of platform to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to limit collusion and, and others. But uh, one clarifying question. So is the Q-learning algorithm simple enough that we could have analytical predictions? That's from uh, Daniel Garrett. Like for instance, could we predict a price bounded away from the collusive price without the simulations? Um, no, not as far as I'm aware. No. No. I mean, it looks simple, but actually it's not so simple. No. Okay, so I think now uh, it's better for you to, to kind of wrap up and then leave other uh, interesting questions for Q&A. Okay, so maybe let me just spend one minute on this slide just to tell you some other things which we do, which we think are interesting. Um, so in the paper, we also vary um, the number of firms. So we allow for three firms. Um, basically, we find results, again, qualitatively consistent with the theory. We also look at this dynamic price-directed prominence, but we vary the level of this ADV, this cushion that is given to the advantaged firm. And here, interestingly, we find something which is a little bit different from theory. So theory would predict that once you increase ADV enough, you get marginal cost pricing, and making ADV even higher won't change that. What we actually find when we run the algorithms is that consumer surplus is an inverted U-shape in ADV. So in other words, moderate increases in ADV um, push up consumer surplus, but if you make ADV too large, if you give too large an advantage, you may get stuck at high prices and consumers suffer. Okay, and so we attribute this to a way in, to, the, to the fact that algorithms learn in a different way to how we derive the result from a game theoretic point of view. So there's a difference in how the, how the algorithms learn. This may touch on some of the questions uh, later. Throughout the talk, I focused on how do these interventions affect prices and consumer surplus. Of course, um, you know, platforms may feel that they have a responsibility to, uh, to target collusion on their platform. Um, they may, may, may view themselves as like a gatekeeper. Um, but even if they just care about profitability, it's not so obvious not necessarily obvious that they might want very high prices. Um, so we show both in theory and in practice that um, these interventions can increase both the amount that is sold on the platform and also the revenue of uh, sellers. Okay, and so to the extent that the platform makes money um, either from per unit fees or because it takes a fixed share of revenue, the platform itself may want to carry out these interventions. So in particular, we show it's possible both uh, in theory and in and the simulations for consumer surplus and platform profit to go up. Um, okay, so I guess it's almost quarter two, so let me, so let me wrap up. So we've considered two very simple uh, policies which steer demand to certain firms. We've shown that in theory, the effect of those policies depends on whether or not the market is cartelized. Um, in simulations, we saw that broadly speaking, the results are kind of consistent with theory, but we think there are interest, some interesting differences especially relating to differences in how algorithms learn compared to how we derive the theory results. Um, very simple steering policies, which depend only on current prices, may not be enough to undermine collusion and algorithmic collusion, um, and subtler, subtler policies might be needed. Now, of course, we've looked at two very simple policies here, um, but nevertheless, we believe that these results are kind of a proof of concept that platform design can be used to raise consumer surplus, and as I alluded to at the end, also platform profit, even when algorithms are being used and irrespective, coming back to the debate that I mentioned at the beginning, irrespective of whether those algorithms lead to more or less competitive outcomes. Okay, so with that, thank you for your attention and uh, I look forward to the discussion. Uh, thank you, Andrew. And uh, we, will, we will have, uh, it seems, quite a lot of discussion. Before then, uh, Alex McKay uh, from HBS will uh, discuss. Thank you, uh, Andrew and Hannah. So thank you, and thank you for having me discuss. This is a very nice paper from a great trio of scholars, um, and I'm happy to be doing the discussion. 
Um, and uh, you can hear me okay, Anna? Excellent, okay. Um, so I was encouraged not to have slides, no slides. Here's what I'm gonna do. First, I'm gonna go over high level motivation. Then I'm gonna quickly summarize what I think this paper does. Um, the third thing I'm gonna do is actually talk about potential future directions for research based on this. And then I'm gonna come back to that a little bit with a few specific questions uh, for Andrew. So high level motivation, I think is a really nice paper to help understand competition with platforms. You know, and in particular, a really hot topic right now is sort of antitrust concerns related to steering. And I think this is squarely in that area. Even more broadly, what we're looking at, we're looking at questions of what do platforms do and what should they do? And I think this paper helps us understand that in sort of interesting and nuanced ways. Um, what should they do both from perspective of, you know, antitrust, but also from the motivations of the platform. So I think that's really nice. What this paper does is it's a rich theoretical investigation into a relevant and timely question. And Andrew sort of showed some extensions at the end. There's a lot in this paper. Um, I think it's very thorough and some really nice features. I wanna say that the, the key question they're kind of asking is does price directed prominence, i.e. prioritizing low price products, benefit consumers or harm consumers? And we, we sort of get two answers here really. The first answer is it depends on whether or not firms are colluding. And the second answer is it also depends on whether or not they're using machine learning algorithms. So it's nice to kind of look at both of these dimensions with respect to that question. And I think their solution of this dynamic policy is, is really interesting and has this nice feature that it, it, it sort of parallels what a collusive policy would look like from the firm side. So fight a collusive dynamic policy with you know, this platform's dynamic policy. So I think there's some nice subtlety there. Um, so now stepping back a bit and just thinking, okay, where might other papers or other research go from here as related to it? I, again, I think thinking about what do and what should platforms do. I mean, I know there's a rich literature on this, but I, I also think this paper is an illustration. There's still a lot of features that deserve, you know, additional consideration. Um, and then when I think about the relation of algorithms to platforms, there are a few things that come to mind. Um, one thing that, you know, this paper focuses on are learning algorithms and how do learning algorithms lead to certain um, pricing behaviors. There are, you know, a couple other features of algorithms that sort of have been acknowledged and, and, and studied. One is algorithms prediction power, you know, that can be related to learning, but not, you know, that's not um, really the focus of this paper or the Calvano et al paper. So there's learning, there's prediction. There's also automation itself. So when we think about, you know, Andrew sort of mentioned Amazon Marketplace, when we look at the pricing strategies that a lot of these sellers actually use on the marketplace, they're often very simple automated strategies, you know, and that's, there's some relation to some work I've done, um, but, but moreover, I think even thinking about on platforms, it'd be really interesting to think about the intersections of these features of algorithms and sort of what platforms do. Um, so they're looking at one element, but I think there's a, there's a really rich space here. Um, I, th I also think, you know, for future research, there are some uh, sort of unanswered the theoretical questions with respect to Q learning. Um, I think Daniel Garrett asked about one of them earlier, you know, what, what are some properties here? Um, you know, I, I just think there's a lot more to be done in this area. You know, I think one thing you might want to ask is why would, you know, sellers on a marketplace choose to adopt this sort of learning algorithm versus other kinds of learning algorithms. I think there's, you know, there are a lot of questions in this area and they're, they are, they're targeting one. And I think they're executing on it well. I just want to sort of motivate some additional research to build on this. Um, I do have a few specific questions. The first one is um, may, maybe the broadest and, and I'll just outline all the questions. Happy to get Andrew's thoughts. Um, I think, you know, one thing I think about, this is kind of motivated by the marketplace and the buy box. But if I think about the buy box on Amazon, there, there are actually many features that I think of that aren't in this particular model. Um, you know, the first thing is that there's search frictions. First, you have to arrive at Amazon's website, then you have to search for a particular product. And then it's only when you get to the product page that you actually see the buy box. So there are actually like three steps for prominence in that market and they're sort of collapsing it all to one specific step. You can think of it as an analogy for search, what they're doing, but again, it's sort of one specific step, but search fictions are actually really important, right? In, in the model that 
Andrew and co-authors look at, differentiation is tied to the product and is, you know, and is a benefit to consumers. But if you're in a world with search friction and often the buy box distinguishes between purely homogenous products, consumers might actually benefit by only having to look at one product if they're purely homogenous. So that's sort of another consideration that's not really um, included in this model. You know, also in the marketplace, often there are many sellers. Um, you know, it's not a setting where you have two or three sellers like the experimental investigation. There's a wide range of prices for these sellers. Um, they have diverse pricing strategies. You know, so if I think about two or three sellers using, you know, a particular symmetric learning algorithms, you know, it, it, I'm just not sure if that's exactly what's going on on the buy box. So it's, and it's also not really the typical setting you would think of for collusion. Um, so that's, that's just sort of a comment on like the specific, um, you know, motivating example here. But I mean, I think this is what they're studying here is quite generally applicable. Um, and, you know, even, even to some extent, like think about the typical retailer choice of whether or not to stock Coke or Pepsi, you know, at their retail location, that's a product where you have, you know, you have, you have two different brands and some differentiation, potential collusion there, and they're deciding, you know, whether or not to include one of those products. So I, I think this is a quite general problem, but I would encourage, you know, maybe thinking a little bit or just wondering a little bit about thinking, you know, Emma, is there am I missing something sort of with the marketplace link there? Um, again, maybe there's just future research to be done there. Um, the two other specific questions, one is just, I thought it was interesting that there was non-monotonicity with the algorithm prices with respect to gamma. So I was wondering if you had some intuition as to why that might be coming up, because I think that was a little different from what you might expect from the theory. Um, and then the third specific question was on, you know, you, you do this exercise you didn't get to um, on uh, the critical growth elasticity, but basically asking from the platform's perspective, how much benefit do you have to give the consumers to, to generate excess profits? And so I was, I was sort of wondering if you thought about other ways of doing that, um, in particular, looking at just, if I get one additional consumer, how much more profit do I have to get from that consumer from other products or down the road? And if that sort of gives us intuitive results. But overall, I thought this was a really excellent paper, um, very well done, and uh, looking forward to hearing uh, the discussion after this. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. So, uh, so now let's uh, let's move to the to to Q and A. And uh, I uh, at this point, I think it's uh, it's best if people unmute themselves and ask questions. But I would propose that we start first with the questions that have already been asked and I postponed. So uh, uh, Jay Peel had a, uh, had a question. Uh, Jay, do you want to um, uh, do you want to ask uh, ask it yourself, or should I read it from the chat? Okay, so I will ask the question. Yeah. So I'm wondering, uh, rather than showing one product to to everybody, so what if the platform has some kind of information about uh, consumer preferences and do uh, individualized uh, uh, showing? So that uh, in that case, I think that. Uh, the variety problem can be also mitigated for consumers. Um, yeah, so I agree that would be a good point. I mean, in the, the theory, the theory part is obviously very stark, but in the simulations, we do allow for some consumers to see everything. And I guess if the platform had some information about consumers' matches with products, they could probably do better matching between who gets shown this limited section selection and who gets shown everything to perhaps mitigate the variety loss a little bit. So I agree, yeah, that's a good point. And then uh, Andre and Jacques had a similar question. So I don't know which one of you want to ask it. I'm happy to, I'm happy to follow up. Actually, so it's the follow up on JPL's question. It made me think that um, basically you can think of the platform as having multiple measures or multiple design choices. So the, the ones you look at are mainly design choices that are, um, whose effect will be to essentially increase competition and lower prices. What J, I mean, my intuition, what JPL is asking is that, so for example, uh, showing uh, consumers, uh, showing, the, uh, showing uh, personalized offers would basically go in the opposite direction. So it might lead to higher equilibrium prices. So 
and then the, the natural question is how should we think about the incentives of the platform? Like in general, it's not clear whether the platform would want equilibrium prices to be higher or lower. I mean, I guess it depends whether it gets transaction fees from the prices, depends if you also factor in consumer participation decisions on the platform and so on. So how, how, how should we think about that? Um, should, I, should I maybe go with this second point first? So that's, yeah, so that's a good point. So we have a little bit in the paper uh, where we also look at um, platform profits. So it's true that it depends a little bit about how the platform um, earns its fees. If, for example, it earns per unit fees, then it's very easy to come up both in theory and in the simulations um, with situations where the platform actually benefits at the same time as it increases consumer surplus. Um, if the platform gets per revenue sharing fees, then you can also find that these interventions increase platform profits. It turns out it is a bit more difficult. Um, and so this is what, by the way, Alex, thanks, thanks for the great discussion. Um, so as Alex mentioned in the discussion, we also then look at a critical growth elasticity. So we say, well, sometimes these interventions might, for example, reduce um, revenue. And so that might seem to reduce platform profits, but arguably if the intervention is increasing consumer surplus um, by a fair bit, then maybe that might pull more consumers to the platform. And so we compute um, how, how elastic the, the size of the user base with respect to consumer surplus has to be in order for the platform to be made whole. And we show that often that's, or in my opinion, the numbers are not very large in order to make that happen. So it's a good point, but I would argue that many of these interventions can simultaneously benefit consumers and also the platform. Thank you. Okay. So on um, Greg Taylor. Um, sure. So uh, you sell this as um, sort of being about algorithmic pricing. Um, it sort of seems what's going on is that um, this learning algorithm is converging to something like an equilibrium. And so I wondered, um, you know, why do you think this is specifically about algorithmic pricing? Why couldn't we apply it more broadly to uh, any kind of situation where firms are colluding in equilibrium? Um, and then another quick question, if I may, is... Um, you said at the start of your talk that nobody really knows um, how the Amazon buy box works. Um, it seems like if um, this was really about trying to influence firms' ability to collude, they'd want to go out of their way to publicize, you know, in particular what the value of this advantage is. And so I wondered if you could comment on that at all. Thank you. Um, so maybe, maybe let me go for the, the second point first. So that's, yeah, so the why does Amazon not um, publicize that? I think that's a very good question. I mean, I guess on the one hand, you might be tempted to say, well, if they gave, I mean, I'm sure it's a very complicated rule anyway, but um, they might open themselves up to problems of gaming. Um, they might want to change it at some point, I guess, as well. On the other hand, um, there are studies that have, that have scraped data and there, is, there are certain things you can learn. So I guess as a trade-off, you don't want to give too much information you might open yourself up to gaming but if if and it seems like increasingly sellers have access to quite complicated tools which can analyze how the buy box works they may get the essence of it anyway so i guess that would be my answer i'm not sure if that's a if that's a great answer to a question it's but the question is very well taken okay so uh what i will do now i will uh stop the recording uh but we uh, still have uh